Uh, my name is Ben Blair, and I'm the treasurer of the IU chapter of the Federalist Society, which means that I pay for that lunch that you're eating right now. And I'd like to welcome you to this uh, John Templeton Foundation debate on the financial crisis. This is obviously impacting a lot of us, if not all of us, in, this, in the job search that we're all going through. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention and thank a few of our professors that really helped us set up this event. Uh, Sarah Jane Hughes, Brian Brownman, and Timothy Lynch definitely helped plan this event today, so uh, we would not be as successful if it wasn't for them. Uh, today we have two very distinguished panelists. Uh, Fred Smith is president and founder of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based free market public policy group established in 1984. He is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate from Tulane with a B.S. degree in theoretical mathematics and political science and also did graduate work in mathematics and applied mathematical economics at Harvard, SUNY Buffalo, and Penn. Mr. Smith frequently appears on national TV and radio programs like Crossfire 2020, Talk of the Nation, uh, to, to debate regulatory uh, <laughs> initiatives and policy issues. His work has been published in all sorts of academic journals such as the Harvard Journal of Law and Economics and the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Mar Martin Speckler is a professor of economics at IPUI up in Indianapolis. He's also a Phi Beta Kappa graduate, and he's from Harvard College, and he was an assistant professor of economics and social studies there during the 1970s. Since coming to Indiana, he has won three teaching awards and written more than 100 articles, mostly on the political economy of Eurasia. He appears frequently on WFIU and in the local newspaper on subjects such as energy, the Middle East, peak oil. And finally, our moderator today is Timothy Lynch, a visiting professor in international business transactions and international trade law. Professor Lynch will introduce the debate topic and the format. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thanks, Ben, and thank you all for coming. Uh, and I'd like to thank our panelists for bringing you here. Uh, to debate this uh, very important topic and to give us their insights. Uh, before we start the debate, I'm going to give you all a brief um, uh, synopsis of the recent events, the, the financial crisis events. And I'll start in October 2007. At the time, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was well over 1,400. Unemployment was 4.7%. <laughs> Uh, it soon became evident that uh, there was a whole set of overvalued assets uh, within the financial system, most notably securities based on subprime home mortgages. Um, in March 2008, Bear Stearns, largely as a result of his exposure to these uh, subprime mortgage securities, was on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, and on the assumption that Bear Stearns uh, might collapse and would lead to a cascade of the collapse of other financial institutions, and particularly other systemically important institutions, the Federal Reserve engineered a, uh, a takeover of Bear Stearns by J.P. Morgan Chase. Nevertheless, within six months, um, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were nationalized. Uh, uh, Merrill Lynch was also taken over in a, in a Federal Reserve engineered takeover, this time by the Bank of America. Lehman Brothers was allowed to collapse. Uh, commercial banks all over the country were collapsing. Um, AIG also on the verge of collapse, received approximately $120 billion in credits from the, Treasury, from the Federal Reserve uh, to prevent its collapse. The stock market was plummeting, credit was drying up, and unemployment was on the rise. So in response to this crisis, the Congress did a couple of things. Uh, in October 08, it created the uh, Troubled Asset Relief Program, which authorized the Treasury Department to purchase up to $700 billion of um, assets and equities in financial institutions. The Congress also, almost exactly one year ago, uh, enacted an uh, Economic Stimulus Act, uh, which provided a set of government spending and entitlement and tax credits totaling almost $800 billion. The Federal Reserve also took some additional steps. It lowered the, um, the target federal funds rate to near zero, which is a rate that it's been at for about a year. Uh, and it also doubled the nation's uh, money supply uh, through a series of lending facilities. So where do we stand now? Well, to date, the federal stimulus package has spent about $200 billion in government grants, uh, loans, and contracts, and about $200 billion in um, entitlements and other tax credits. 
uh, the Treasury Department has committed about $500 billion in TARP funds. Now, the Treasury has announced that it plans to wind down the TARP program, and to date, uh, financial institutions which have received TARP monies have paid back approximately $162 billion. The Dow, after reaching a low of about 6,500 last year, is now hovering around uh, 10,000. Unemployment is at 9.7%. We may be out of recession. Uh, some predict that we may enter a double dip recession. Others have advocated that Congress pass another stimulus act. Um, with these facts in mind, uh, I want to turn the floor over to our debaters to give us their insights about the wisdom of the steps taken to address the crisis and about steps we should take going forward. And just briefly, the format will be, they're going to speak for about six minutes each. I will ask a set of questions to our uh, guests, and then I'll open up the floor to the audience to ask questions. So first, Mr. Smith. Okay. 21, right? Um, this is going to be a quick uh, narrative about the roots of the financial crisis, because I think it's important to understand why, where we got here, how we got here before we can go into detail about how we get out. I speak from the perspective of classical liberalism, the group that believes that people should be free and be responsible for, responsible for their actions. Um, but there are competing visions, and you're going to hear, I think, two today. Uh, the two polars are the classical liberal vision, which focuses on voluntary arrangements, market creation of wealth, and believes that you're disciplined by com competition, and the wealth redistribution elements of politics, which are to be disciplined more or less by political regulatory policy. Um, humans aren't angels, we're not gods, not close to being gods, and therefore disciplines are, already necessary, are always necessary, but whether the regulatory disciplines that emerge from market forces or the bureaucratic, Disciplines that emerge from, from politics is something we'll get into later, I think. Um, both pol political institutions and private institutions are critical to a society. We need a mixed economy in a sense, but the two spheres, the private and the public sphere, I think are very critically separated because they don't blend very well together. And my theme is that the mixed economy model has caused the problems we're seeing today. There's always been a sort of an urge, a lust, a desire to mix the efficiency values of the market. Wouldn't it be great to have the creative energies of a free market and the moral egalitarian values of a moral just government? Can't we mix the two together? Can't we set up a, a mixed economy where the market will row efficiently, but the government will steer the ship of state into more morally desirable waters? My argument is that's exactly the model that's prevailed in Europe and the United States for the last century, and we're seeing the consequences of it, and I think the further consequences are going to be even more disastrous. There are two GSEs, government-sponsored enterprises, that result from this form of a mixed economy. One is the Federal Reserve, and the other is our various housing institutions, particularly Fannie and Freddie. First, the Fed. Easy money was a point of this debate, as, as Professor Lynch mentioned. Let me explain what I think the Austrian classical liberal view is of monetary policy. Think of a big vat of cold molasses with 12 pipes coming out of it with valves on each one of them flowing onto a cold marble table. The valves are turned by the Federal Reserve. Sometimes a lot of molasses flows out. Sometimes very little flows out. As it comes out of these 12 spigots onto this big plate, it creates waves. Those waves interact with some of the flows from the other uh, spigots, and you have this complicated table of waves and ripples throughout. As that wave or ripple passes over a part of the economy, the people perceive, rightly so, that they're wealthier. Money is flowing into our area. Let's invest more. As the trough passes over, oh my God, we're poor. Cut back, disinvest. That cycle of overinvestment and underinvestment, which occurs because these ripples, creates what the Austrians view as, a, as the business cycle. And because politics interferes with how those valves are being cut on and off, there's a very great danger that monetary policy itself is one of the causes of the business cycle. That's the theory of Austrian economics. Easy, econo easy money is always useful to, at least in the short run, grow the economy. Stable money is obviously a good idea, no inflation, to ensure that over time people can make long-range plans because the metric of unit, how much money you're going to make, isn't going to be continuously expanding over time. The problem is politics interferes with that process. Arthur Burns pointed out when he was, uh, why did you always uh, 
compromised with Congress. He said, how else could the Fed reserve its independence? That idea is a very serious problem. We inflated the currency in the Carter era, we closed it down, inflation in the Volcker era, and then Greenspan, responding to the tech burden, uh, bubble, decided to ease up on money. The money flowed into the housing market. Why into the housing market? Why not into other parts of the economy? Because housing has been one of the areas where we're focused on the American dream. Both Republicans, ownership society, and liberals, uh, rep uh, Democrats, access of housing to all, get away from the redlining discriminatory policies of the past, have promoted housing above all other American dreams. And the result was we've overinvested in the cap, we've sent too much capital into the housing markets and not enough into other markets. And to do that, we had to lower the standards on mortgages throughout our economy. Fannie and Freddie, the two government-sponsored enterprises, were told, go out and act like businesses, but make sure every American is in a home in a certain period of time. The way you did that was to lower standards for lower-income people, lower credit standards, mortgage standards. But if you lower them for lower-income people, you're certainly going to lower them for everyone else. And the result was the housing boom that has now crashed. Fannie and Freddie became go-go firms. They built massive quantities of poor-valued loans but they qualified as prime loans. They sent them out to build the edifices of financial innovation, the securitized, mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, CDO squares, and all the financial engineering instruments that have been very creative, but all built out of unsound bricks, and the result was the destruction we see before us. 64% home ownership in the 1990s. We went to 69% ownership, and we collapsed the world economy. Not a very good achievement. But Obama and Bush, the Bush-Obama team, which seemingly has exactly the same policies in these areas, have thrown money at the problem, have expanded the moral hazards that are present when you guarantee a government, a, a private institution with taxpayer money. Uh, they've avoided bankruptcy and uh, orderly de a resolution of some of the bad, bad ca capital allocations. And all of this, I think, was created by the mixed economy model. You can have honest socialism, you can have honest capitalism, but when you mix the two together, you end up with chimera, the nightmare that has caused the collapse we have today. <clears throat> well, uh, to get some idea of what uh, the American economy should uh, be doing now, we need to know why. Uh, we got into this severe and long-lasting uh, slump. Professor Lynch, in the two minutes permitted him, has given us a short narrative, but not the causes of the problem. And Mr. Smith has, well, I guess, focused on one cause among several, uh, that is providing more housing for poor people. Uh, notice that he doesn't talk about the uh, the tax uh, treatment of jumbo and uh, large mortgages for its rich friends. So you always have to worry about uh, whose ox is getting gored uh, by these, uh, uh, by these uh, conservatives. Now, gratifying as it is to beat up on a libertarian or a Republican, <laughs> I would insist that the causes of the financial crisis are rather more complicated than hubris or the failure of foresight or government overreach in promoting housing. Fact is that uh, even as Alan Greenspan has now had to admit, uh, market discipline alone, uh, the pure capitalist model uh, of financial markets has failed. And um, uh, so uh, we need to know why uh, we are in this situation and how to, uh, uh, to address it. Uh, I dare say that Fred Smith has absolutely no answer uh, because neither pure capitalism nor pure socialism has worked anywhere in the world. Um, and yet the success of the American economy and the West European economy is uh, well uh, documented and clear to anybody who visits these places as I hope Fred has. Um, why this deep depression? Well, um, as we've seen many, many times in economic history, 
a balance uh, sheet uh, recession is a normal result of a financial crisis. And this time, the epicenter of that crisis was what are, should be known as the shadow banking system. Uh, and the, hu the chief expression of that crisis was the housing boom in the U.S. and several other countries, uh, encouraged by very low interest rates, negligent regulatory oversight, and predatory and deceitful practices by some mortgage lenders, together with fraud and uh, imprudence by their customers. Now, it's true that Congress, uh, by, uh, in a bipartisan way, has encouraged a wider home ownership, and I think that's a very worthy objective. If we want healthy neighborhoods in our cities, uh, a, an objective we have not yet achieved quite clearly. And this was done through the government sponsors, uh, Freddie Mac and uh, Fannie Mae. But remember that the housing boom, uh, which he blames on Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, was worldwide. The housing boom was worldwide. In Ireland, the Netherlands, Australia, UK, and even Canada, all of them with a lag, despite differences in policy. So how do you blame the housing boom in the United States on a very peculiar set of policies, which, by the way, um, I think were uh, and continue to be a good idea? The phenomenon was influenced, it seems, by an increase of desired savings uh, worldwide. Uh, competent economists such as Robert Schiller and Carl Case warned that housing prices, particularly on the coasts, were moving away from normal relationship to rents, but the market paid no attention. Uh, Fred, the Federal Reserve Chair Alan Greenspan was convinced that the inflation of asset prices would be no danger to the system. His main job would be offsetting ordinary commodity prices, which he thought were in danger of deflation. Falsely, it turned out. So he kept the federal funds rate low and applauded uh, Bush's tax cuts, which was uh, improper and not part of his job, uh, and turned out to aggravate the situation. The idea that asset markets are self-correcting has been shown to be false and dangerous, and even such right-wing figures as Gary Becker, whom I very much respect, and the Cato Institute have blamed uh, uh, Alan Greenspan, lifelong acolyte of the vulgar libertarian Ayn Rand. Now, the, the shadow banking system are those unregulated investment banks, hedge funds, and other financial firms which are not subject to deposit insurance or regulation by federal authorities, as commercial banks are. Both these and ordinary mortgage uh, uh, lenders were encouraged by financiers and by public policy to off offload their debt in complex securities to investors here and abroad uh, who were loaded with funds and eager for the high promised returns and reassured by the AAA credit ratings from well-established agencies that had worked well in the past. Now, this created an overload of debt on balance sheets at too big to fail institutions such as Bear Stearns. Why were they too big? They were too big because of the negligent antitrust enforcement of the previous eight years and before, and even during the Reagan administration. Negligent antitrust regulation. Uh, one an, uh, essential part of a mixed economy of which I am the, an advocate is active antitrust regulation, which is the only way in an active capitalist economy to assure the kind of competition we need for the welfare of the public and for innovation. Uh, with these institutions, uh, a, uh, these um, uh, shadow banking institutions, a herd mentality fed of greed and ex inexperience of risk led young financiers to go for ever more exposure. And governments uh, also at 
responsible. They had repeatedly merged away or otherwise resolved financial crises such as the savings and loan crisis of 1994. Finally, um, so governments helped create the idea of too big to fail, and now it's going to be a very difficult thing uh, uh, way, uh, way back. So uh, in conclusion, uh, it does seem as if uh, the situation was uh, uh, set up to be extremely difficult for uh, Secretary of Treasury Henry Paulson uh, when he was confronted with the first of um, these institutions that apparently, at least in hindsight, uh, were uh, too big uh, to fail. So what many thought, including Alan Greenspan and many Republicans and Libertarians, what many thought could not happen, happened and not for the first time. A minute response? <laughs> sure, you can have a minute response. Um, as one who in year 2000 did in fact point out that Fannie and Freddie, which were mixed economy groups, not market institutions, had actually create, were creating vast problems for the economy because as government guaranteed institutions, private in the sense that they could go out and become go-go bankers, but political in the sense that if anything wrong, you and I ended up paying for it, Laws, cap, profit side capitalism, law side um, socialism. It was Fannie and Freddie who were the ones who were the gatekeepers for this outpouring of badly created structures. And they, in that time, 2000, were $100 billion organizations. I was asked, well, these are great respected organizations. They're making housing available for what? A few percentage points of the US population. And of course, speculators were making those same profits at much greater extent. Why are you worried about institutions that everybody knows are so good? I said, well, they're $100 billion now, and they could double in size to $200 billion, and if they fail, we're all on the hook, just like the SNL crisis, where we may agree on, was done by the fact that deposit insurance created a moral hazard, attracting frauds, incompetence, and crooks into the industry. Billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, flowed out of the normal economy into bankrupt SNLs, and was lost. We lost $200 billion there. We're going to lose $2 trillion probably before this is all over. And we did it because in both cases, we disconnected the market disciplines of, of competition, and we did nothing, or we failed, to make the political regulatory disciplines work anywhere well as good. This is what we have had. This is what we're doing now. Everything that we've done with Paulson and with Geithner and with Bush and with Obama has made the problems we faced in the SNL crisis and again in the housing crisis perpetual. Professor Speckler, would you like? Uh, no. Uh, you know, you can talk uh, all you want about uh, the, the failures of Freddie and so on, but um, uh, Fred has absolutely no answer to the fact that this was a worldwide housing boom. Um, uh, booms such as these have occurred uh, several times in the history of capitalism, and yet we're still here. The main point, however, is uh, that whatever the financial consequences are, millions of Americans are in their own home. And think about the concrete, real advantages of uh, FHA, of VA mortgages, uh, and of other government-supported mortgages that have put veterans, poor people, and others into their own home where they can rear their families in a decent way. That's the thing that uh, honest people ought to keep their uh, eye on. Well, let me run with some of the issues that Professor Speckler has brought up. Um, Mr. Smith, it seems to me that you're putting your finger you're pointing your finger directly at Fannie and Freddie in particular. And the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve. With regard to Fannie and Freddie, it seems to me that they were only able to do what they were doing, uh, making all of these loans, guaranteeing these loans, because there was a wealth of credit outside of Fannie and Freddie that was pouring in, willing to invest in this. Now, certainly these um, creditors and potential creditors uh, weren't being forced by some sort of government uh, regulation to invest. They had the wherewithal to do their own uh, uh, investment analysis and determine the risk and decide whether or not to invest. It seems to highlight a problem with 
you know, kind of the free market and the ability of investors to make wise decisions and highlights the existence of bubbles. Now, the argument, and this is one that we've heard twice now, um, that in effect, yes, there were dishonest brokers, the government institutions who were pouring out poorly formulated loan packages, but why did the buyers, why were they so gullible? Well, they were gullible in part because they were defrauded. Fannie and Freddie weren't saying these were questionable high-risk loans. They were telling everyone they were prime mortgages. There now is a massive number. One estimate that is, Peter Wallison, has that two-thirds of the bad loans out there were originated by government agencies, mostly Fannie and Freddie, but other groups too. The argument was those bricks were came, came out not as, these are low-quality, low-price bricks. That would have been a market decision whether they made sense or not. They came across as prime AAA assets. And the way the regulatory process is, if you can get those kind of assets and it's on your books, whether you're an investment bank or a regular bank, and those allow you to lend more frequently. Everybody wanted high risk, uh, high payoff, low risk issues. Fannie and Freddie pretended to give those people that. Massive edifice was built on those. And those, of course, went around the world. And the US started the process, but it triggered everything. Other companies were, and other nations, and investors in other countries were building these institutions based on the trust in the American economy and the fact that no one would let Fannie and Freddie do these foolish things. But Bush did to some extent, oh, they tried it one time weekly to do something about it. But the, the Martin Franks of the world, in a desperate attempt, and maybe even a moral attempt, to push a few more people into homes, 64 to 69, and we're back to 67 now. It wasn't millions. It's a tiny fraction of the population that received these massive subsidies in order to turn many, many Americans bankrupt, their firms closed down. Whatever moral value we wanted to do in our housing dreams has been destroyed in this last thing. And to argue that that was a moral vision and a moral outcome is strange to me. <clears throat> well, I suppose Fred and I can afford our mortgages, um, but not everybody, uh, not everybody can. I'd like to remind people who don't know that this country has a serious inequality problem as well as a serious race of problem, and it's not uh, it's not so becoming, I think for people who have taken, uh, who have had the advantages that Fred and I have had, uh, to ignore uh, the uh, interests of people who um, have not had those advantages. And uh, it's, I think it's very important, uh, uh, and the Congress on a bipartisan basis considered that moving people into stable neighborhoods with their own homes was a good idea and uh, that it would, uh, in part, offset uh, the uh, negative effects of uh, road building and other things that the government had done, uh, which were disadvantaged uh, to um, uh, low-income uh, low people. So uh, the problem with uh, the uh, influx of funds is that they went too much into housing. Uh, they didn't go enough into schools, uh, which are still dilapidated in many parts of the country. They didn't go enough into uh, environmental protection, cleanup, uh, sewer, uh, and because this country resists an adequate level of taxation to support public goods, which would be in the public interest. The American dream was distorted because we went into, we called it the American dream, and it was housing. That was a political decision, bipartisan. The other issues that the professors mentioned are all adequate, and there are lots more. We also put too much money into student loans, who generally went to wealthier people too. The housing subsidies went to wealthy people because if you're gonna lower standards for low-income people, you lower them for everyone, and there's a lot more uh, advantages to being a rich person who wants a low interest loan in the second or third home than there is to be a poor individual who's forced into a home that they can't afford to stay within. The interesting thing about the left on this issue is their talk about redlining. The, uh, the for some reason, capitalists turn down perfectly adequate credit risk because of their inherent racism or prejudice or whatever. At the same time, 
those same lending institutions force poor, unsuspecting minorities groups to overextend themselves in credit. The banking industry is accused of redlining and predatory lending at the same time because outcomes bad in both cases occur, but they pick winners and losers. This is what politics is about, pretending you can have a, head, a coin that has heads on both sides. Uh, uh, people here may be too young to remember the scandal of redlining, uh, where uh, major banks in the in, um, in large uh, cities um, uh, drew a red line around large neighborhoods, uh, uh, mostly uh, low-income African American and immigrant communities, and said, "We will not." Uh, grant mortgages, ordinary mortgages under normal terms uh, for any um, uh, construction or any purchase in those areas. Um, and they did that on a wholesale basis. Was that wrong? Yes. And the uh, our democratic system, uh, which is part of uh, the political economy of America, the democratic part, uh, uh, made sure that uh, this redlining practice was outlawed. It's interesting to notice that the redlining study that that followed the line of reason you just heard from the professor was done by the Boston Fed. It, fa it claimed that it, it, we were redlining on racist grounds. These people were perfectly a good credit risk, but they were being discriminated against and so forth, and that changed lending practices throughout the United States. It turns out, of course, the study was fraudulent. It wasn't true. Capitalist adults rarely turn down people because of their race or anything else. They're after profits, not perpetuating cultural patterns of the past. The challenge we've seen over and over again is that government policy can perpetuate those pr prejudice policies. We saw that in housing policies. We saw it in the area I grew up in, in Louisiana, with Jim Crow laws. Capitalism has a value in reaching out to minorities and others and finding creative ways of, of dealing and providing them services. That is not a virtue that politics looking to the past often has. We see that with the attack on predatory lending, which is an attempt to democratize credit and move people away from pawn shops and, and mafioso lenders to the normal credit market. That's attacked, and yet we all are find that at the same time, somehow redlining is a crime. Redlining was a fraudulent issue by the time the Fed study was done, it distorted housing markets further than they would. It was a racist policy in ways because what it did was it forced people into credit beyond their means, and those people have suffered far more than the professor and I have. Let me jump in for a second. I know a lot of you need to leave for class. You should feel free to get up and, and, and leave. Um, I don't think there's any disagreement in this room that redlining is bad. Um, to follow up on something, I, you know, I actually am a recipient of a VA housing loan. I don't need it. Uh, you've made some comments, Mr. Smith, about, about how the government shouldn't steer, steer um, the citizenry into home ownership, but I'm not sure exactly why that should be the case. Why shouldn't they steer? I mean, Professor Speckler has noted some things that creates it contributes to neighborhood stability. It's a form of savings, maybe paternalistically forced savings uh, when people won't otherwise do it. It uh, creates stable families. What, what's, wrong, what's, what's wrong with encouraging home ownership? Because there are many, many things that many, many American dreams, education, starting your own small business, relocating, uh, a better retirement activities. To pick one of those American dreams and give it high priority means to argue that we know better than the individuals do. And as the professor said, and I think we in that area are agreement, there are many, many things necessary to create stable neighborhoods. And one of them that it does not create stability is putting too many people in homes that certainly go bankrupt. Nothing has destabilized American neighborhoods more than around America than these neighborhoods that were looked prosperous and now they're full of see-through buildings where nobody's living in. Government tries to advance equality, but its record at doing so is vastly inferior to the markets that he seems to be somewhat skeptical about. Let me change tax just a little bit. Uh, Professor Speckler, you've listed a long, uh, you listed a number of things that contributed to the recent financial crisis. Um, do you have a prescription for what we should do to prevent this from happening again, or do you think these are inevitable cycles of boom and busts? 
Well, <laughs> never ask a professor whose uh, expertise is something else uh, <laughs> a question like that. Of course I have ideas about what, <laughs> should, uh, what should be uh, done. Um, and uh, uh, I think the problem is to intervene to prevent uh, bubbles or instability, which is an inherent part of the capitalist system. Uh, because, as George Soros has pointed out, one of our great capitalist financiers, um, bubbles are a part of how uh, financiers actually uh, work. And um, uh, the, uh, I think that the uh, Federal Reserve, um, well, I have to be um, very brief. Um, I think that the um, uh, banks' uh, minimum capital requirements and the traders' margin requirements have to be raised. Uh, the, the big point, big point, is that we have a shadow back banking system which has grown uh, uh, very large compared to regulated commercial banks. And the shadow banking system is largely uh, unregulated and, uh, and not transparent. That's the thing that has to be taken care of. And uh, we have means for doing that by raising minimum capital requirements and margin requirements, um, proprietary trading of both banks and the shadow banks have to be uh, covered by especially high capital. Uh, Basel II, those of you who are familiar with this area, uh, did exactly the reverse. Uh, by uh, saying that securities held by banks would have a lower capital requirement. In fact, they should have a higher one. Um, there are a number of possibilities. But uh, I urge those of you who are really interested in this, and it's not what I do all the time, and maybe that's obvious, um, to investigate what's called resolution authority. Resolution authority carried out, as I hope, by the Fed or by the Federal Trade Commission or by other agencies, not necessarily the Treasury, would be a, a kind of halfway house between bankruptcy, Chapter 13, on the one hand, or bailouts on the other. I think both bankruptcy and bailouts have had difficulty. We need some kind of new concept. And that new concept, which of course I did not invent, is called revolutionary uh, re resolution authority, which would reorganize financial institutions under new management and uh, would convert um, some of the senior debt and subordinated debt to what are called contingent convertible instruments. Boy, there is something for, to investigate. Covered bonds. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, which uh, would mean that uh, some of the liabilities of these banks or shadow banks would be converted to equity under certain uh, more or less automatic conditions. Now, there probably Professor Lynch knows more about this than I do, and I don't claim to be a finance expert. But I think it is clear that both the bankruptcy laws in this area, not to speak of the housing area where they don't operate seemingly at all, and both and bailouts, bailouts have been a political failure. Bankruptcy has been a legal failure. Uh, not because of, lawyer, of lawyers, but because of politicians. We need a new concept which would replace management, uh, which would penalize the risk takers, that is the equity holders, and would um, uh, uh, retain uh, the real assets and the real services that our communities need. Now, it's very important to understand that we should not be throwing out the bathwater with the baby. The baby is real businesses, small businesses, large businesses, banks, homes. Those are the babies. Those are the things that make Americans um, uh, uh, w wealthy. Uh, we have to arrange that the finance system not ruin 
uh, the well-earned prosperity which our parents have uh, left us. Bankruptcy is a proceed to, to hear the professor say bankruptcy is one of those situations where when a company falls into that perilous state, we blow up the buildings and we shoot all the workers. All bankruptcy does is move those assets to a more competent, or at least a more hopefully competent, group of people. What we need to do is to recognize that bankruptcy is already a resolution procedure, that it works. What we've done in this last set of political bankruptcies is take normal law, which involves who gets paid first out of the, out of the unfortunately, smaller pot that we have of assets, and instead pick and choose winners. We've put primary claimants on things and put them to the back of the line because their political clout wasn't as high as the UAW or the unions and so on. Bankruptcy works, but I think there is a problem here that we both agree the too big to fail issue is a serious one. I would basically decide which side are you on, boy? Which side are you on? If you want government subsidies, then you're going to be tightly controlled, you can't pay your people much, and you cannot be very innovative because bureaucrats aren't smart enough to figure out the frontier risk of, a, of any economy. And if you want to be on your own, a free and responsible capitalist adult, then you are, we're going to shoot you before we're going to bail you out again. We've got to break up this idea that we can pick and choose. Well, we'll bail out Bell Stern, Bears, we'll bail out Bear Stern, but we won't bail out Lehman. We'll bail out one auto company, but not another. That means that every capital flow will be a political, political decision. Does anyone trust Barney Frank, President Bush, Obama, or anyone to manage the capital flows of a free society? It won't be free. Well, uh, Barney and I were friends at school, and I do trust uh, Barney. Uh, I, uh, he's a lot funnier than I am, I think. Um, he is funny. Uh, but, uh, and a lot smarter. Uh, but let, let me say about uh, bankruptcy, it's too slow. Too slow. Uh, I, I think uh, it works in a lot of cases, but uh, as we saw in the Lehman case, you really had to resolve the problem over a weekend. Can any court resolve such uh, uh, things over a weekend? I don't think so. I think we need executive authority through a, re a resolution authority uh, uh, to do those things before uh, the security markets open again and bankrupt uh, innocent counterparties. So I think that's the, uh, that's the issue. And as far as uh, government is concerned, I'm not a... Um, uh, uh, a, a person who worships at uh, uh, government uh, uh, buildings, uh, no. But uh, uh, let's not forget that many of the uh, greatest innovations in the American economy, which are often attributed to capitalist firms, came from government subsidies and government laboratories. And that, of course, includes the internet, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, discovery of the uh, the DNA code and many other examples are uh, in the pharmaceutical area are actually the result of government investment uh, in uh, research and development and uh, this country is falling somewhat uh, down we have always done more research and development in this country partly because of our defense uh, establishment than any other country, but uh, it's been allowed to deteriorate. We need more research and development in high-speed transportation, uh, in climate uh, change, and I don't think that uh, the our capitalist uh, enterprises, much as they excel in producing what other people invent, is uh, is the answer. Let me quote you guys just quickly. President Eisenhower gave his farewell address in 1961. Everyone in this room probably has heard about his warning about the military-industrial complex, right? Has anyone looked at the second warning he gave Americans? Nobody has. 
He argued that there were two things, the military-industrial complex, but he said, as the professor said, our increased involvement with military research is leading to a situation where political decisions about research allocation are becoming more and more important to the intellectual establishment. His argument was there was a risk that intellectual curiosity will be replaced by political grant-seeking, that America's democracy may be sacrificed because of a technocratic scientific elite taking over. We've seen that in global warming, climate gate. Okay, Al Gore invented the internet. But other than that, there's a lot of problems out there. I worked at EPA when Sin Fuels, we spent eight billion dollars and we got eight barrels of oil. That's not exactly a way of picking winners that actually win. Going into the future is one of the most difficult things in. To argue that people who have no direct economic stake, profit or loss, are going to be better pioneers through the paths into a future than then private entrepreneurs who lose their shirt if they screw up, I think is at least counterindicated by the history I know. Let me go ahead and open up for the last 15 minutes to uh, questions from the audience. We scared if them. If there are any. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, um, <laughs> first of all, I would agree that it's a real problem. It is a real problem uh, because um, uh, certainly some economists thought that housing prices on the coast and securities prices were a result of um, fundamentals. That's very true. And uh, some people said that the real rate of return on uh, equity <laughs> investments had come down, uh, that is, the, the equity premium r uh, should have, uh, have gone up. So I would agree that uh, economists were not uniform on this. On the other hand, uh, if you compare the cost of housing with the rental, which is the, is the substitute, essentially, it was very clear to people who knew that uh, housing prices had gotten out of line with rental with rental values in uh, and that and that time and I think that uh, Alan Greenspan who was uh, and remains a, a great expert on the figures uh, knew that housing prices were too high he knew uh, uh, at an earlier time that stock prices were too high he simply thought that the uh, market would take care of it so I don't think there is a question of uh, whether uh, no one no one knew. Alan Greenspan knew. Uh, uh, various other regulators at the federal level knew, but uh, they were talked down uh, um, in part by um, uh, Larry Summers, my former colleague, who has a lot to answer for too. I agree in part with what was just said. Feedback mechanisms are critical. There's always going to be confused data out there. Uh, he mentions that rental prices were going up. They started going out in the late 90s. There were three ways you decided what the value of a house was. Comparables, what other houses were selling for. The problem with that in a bubble, those are all correlated and your price looks perfectly reasonable. The other two were rental value, which historically had been one of the other ways you did. And the third was construction costs. If you built a house like that again, what would be its annualized cost? The normal way of creating a value for a house was to take those three estimates and average them. And that was done up until Fannie and Freddie became the dominant players in the global, in the US housing market. It was very complex to figure out those latter two because construction costs vary widely across the country as do rental costs because of customs and other things. But comparables was easy. You just looked in the listings and so on. So we shifted from that tripartite to a unilateral correlated variable which gave us positive feedback. The higher the prices were, the more you could lend out. It was a, it was a bubble. Those other two had been consistent up until I think the 1980s a man named Ed Pinto was done a ma He was a risk manager at Fannie and Freddie until he started raising too many questions and then he was kicked out. This is what happens. Markets have very, 
it's not easy for a capitalist to want to fool themselves because they're the ones who lose. It's not as difficult for a bureaucrat, and Alan Greenspan was a paramount bureaucrat, to fool themselves because if they lose, they lose their reputation. Greenspan surely doesn't look like the god he looked at one time, but they don't go bankrupt. Markets give a more a more intense feedback system. There are feedbacks in all systems, but I think the information was there. I said pieces of it. Ed Pinto said a lot more of it, and he was actually there. But you can ignore that when there are guarantees there that say, don't worry, even if they're right, you're not going to lose money. We, may, we encourage frauds and incompetence to go into these areas because it was, there were profit side gains and the loss sides were ours. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. This is something that probably we have more sympathy on, although we haven't got into it. You know, de Tocqueville said America had a limited government, which we thought was good. It had a free market that he thought was good. But de Tocqueville's real admiration of America was the third sector, the whole little platoons that did all those things that really weren't quite market, and yet you didn't really want to expand the coercive power of government into. I mean, we're a nonprofit, so we're in that situation. Universities are sort of in the between, but a little bit of nonprofits too. I think the challenge is to recognize that we misjudge those. Eunice received a Nobel Prize for microfinance in Bangladesh. Payday loan guys go to jail in Colorado for the same decision, <coughs> or Kansas, wherever it was. We tend to view things from the viewpoint of the relative spread within the economy. We're aware of how poor Bangladesh is, and any extension of credit in that country is seen as a good thing. We're aware of how wealthy we are, and the fact that we have subpopulations that don't fully participate in that wealth, and make choices that the professor I don't have to face. Uh, I don't have to go to a loan shark. I don't have to go to a neighborhood mafioso to borrow money to avoid a much higher fee of missing a credit payment or being kicked out of my house. The choices that are available in a market economy vary from the easy choices of the wealthy to the somewhat very painful choices of the poor. My vision is that capitalism is continuously trying to find ways of democratizing those privileges. Henry Ford, I mean, Europe invented the automobile, and then and now they make wonderful automobiles for very wealthy people. But it was Henry Ford who put the world on wheels who democratized it. Capitalism is not a perfect force. It doesn't achieve that <coughs> utopian vision overnight. But it is a force that continuously tries to do a little better. Government does try to achieve utopian results, but often it has dystopian outcomes. There's a book you all might want to read, and I've I found it intriguing for me because it wasn't on my side and it wasn't on the professor's side. It was called Creative Capitalism, and it's a discussion of Bill Gates's Davos speech of a few years ago, which said there must be something better than capitalism. And then there were 40 essays. Larry Summers had one. People from all over the spectrum had them. And it was interesting because, well, read it, because I thought they didn't come up with a better alternative, and it seems to me some of their alternatives could make a bad situation worse. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville also in volume two of Democracy in America uh, warned about the rising uh, gap between rich and poor and this was in the 1840s 
20. A lot has changed, not for the better, in this, uh, in, in this area. As far as micro lending is concerned, well, I don't think you build uh, modern uh, cities and huge buildings and plants on the basis of micro lending. I, I'm, I'm afraid that there is no uh, escape uh, for young lawyers uh, uh, from making government smarter making government more efficient, making government serve all the people and not just the rich. Um, I think that's something that, um, uh, that a young lawyer would be very well uh, uh, counseled to uh, make um, his or her life's work. And I would say, in my invocation to you, there's a tremendous potential in humanity whether that potential is best really released by good government, which I have some doubts about, but maybe could be better, uh, creative capitalism, which I have much more hopes in, or the third sector, various voluntary activities, is a challenge. But I think America is still, with all of the quarrels we have internally, a utopian society in that we believe the world can become better. I hope we don't think the world could become heaven on earth, but we can become better. And I think our challenges are whether we go into business, government, or the third sector, is to make that contribution because despite all of the problems with America and all of us must be aware that we have warts, this is still the shining city on the hill. We still are the part of the world which does allow many people to come and live variants of the American dream. That is something that is a precious commodity, and I think we preserve it because civilization is a thin veneer on tribal primitivism, atavism, and if we could find ways of moving civilization even somewhat ahead, it would be a wonderful thing to do. A friend of mine, one of my staffers says, you know, Fred, there will always be an America, but if we keep going the way it is now, it's going to move to China. And I think that risk is not without value. At least it'll survive somewhere. But I think America can still turn around and move away from the socialist utopian we're moving to. Do we really want to Europeanize America? What will it look like? France with less good food? I've got a question. Uh, <laughs> in the five minutes we have left, uh, given your different perspectives and values and sense of what sort of framework and macro structure is most effective, um, how do you each perceive the uh, wisdom of the steps taken by Congress and the Fed, specifically the stimulus package, uh, TARP program, uh, and the increased money supply? Um. I think that the uh, stimulus uh, package was too little, but not too late. Uh, it uh, has uh, probably uh, saved uh, between one and a half and two million jobs that might otherwise have been lost, although eight million jobs have been lost. And uh, this was um, uh, really a result of, uh, of past negligence uh, and bad luck. Uh, in the uh, in the previous uh, the previous administration, uh, it is often said that the uh, stimulus package has added greatly to our 1.3 trillion dollar deficit in this fiscal year. Truth is that uh, only less than 10 percent of the deficit is owing to the stimulus uh, package. Uh, I think about a third of the stimulus package has been uh, paid out already. Uh, more is going to be paid out this year in unemployment compensation, of course, also Social Security checks and other kind, and Medicaid, and that's to the good. And we will begin to see some uh, worthwhile infrastructure projects which this country uh, desperately needs. The uh, stimulus package was not just money. It was also various projects, um, research and development and so forth that the country needs and that the Republicans um, uh, probably unwillingly uh, had to go along with uh, because of the obvious danger of a uh, depression in this, uh, in this country. So uh, I think that uh, we uh, 
we, we could use uh, an additional stimulus, but I don't think it's uh, uh, a, an emergency. Uh, things are going in the right direction. Uh, interest rates on the long-term 10-year uh, Treasury are in good shape, uh, which indicates that the market certainly doesn't uh, fear uh, inflation in the immediate uh, future. I think the big problem will be our entitlements. We must uh, work to reform entitlements in various ways or, or else they will, uh, well, not bankrupt, you don't bankrupt a country, uh, but they will certainly create inflationary pressure uh, uh, two or three years out. Now is not the time to do that, but uh, within a year or two, I think the administration must take measures uh, with, I hope, the cooperation of the Republican side of the aisle uh, to reform uh, Medicare and uh, Social Security because those are the uh, those are the gorilla at the gate and uh, not uh, uh, necessarily the war uh, and certainly not the effect of the stimulus package. The big the big risk to your future, the professor and I will be dead before the crisis occurs. Uh, is clearly the entitlement program. Um, we have created a totally non-sustainable set of promises, so has Europe, and you're now beginning to see the beginnings of that forfeiture, that, I don't know what you call what Greece is going through now, but bankruptcy sounds close to what it's going through. You, politicians have made problem, uh, promises in Europe and the United States, Republicans and Democrats, that are non-sustainable. The, the welfare, welfare portion of the welfare regulatory state is, is, is a Ponzi scheme. We can't sustain the promises we've made for Social Security, for Medicare particularly, and yet when we admit that, there's going to be major social discontent. It's going to hit Europe about 10 years before, or maybe 15 years before it hits us, and I have no idea of how Europe is going to transit the cultural turmoil that that's going to create. What we should have done, in my view, is to calm down, not panic. When, when Benanke, Benanke and Paulson on, on a Friday say, the economy's sound and I'd advise everyone to buy a few stocks, and then on Monday morning say, give us $700 billion or your life is going to, the world's going to be destroyed, Nothing could be more panicking than that. These people took a situation where there was nervousness and risk, high risk, and they exacerbated those risks badly. We should have calmed down and allowed the layman situation to have done better. We could have created some form of a, of a guidance committee to accelerate it. We could have asked the courts to quickly resolve these, but layman resolved very well. And there were very few of those downstream systemic risks that was a pretext, the excuse, for rushing in with massive government intervention. Moral hazards, which were certainly an element in this debate, have been worsened. Fannie and Freddie now are not only guaranteed to, to any amount, 400 billion above 400 billion now, but they are not yet on budget. All of those liabilities aren't even on the balance sheet of the U.S. government because of a, well, because of a gimmick, basically. Um, so we've worsened the moral hazard problem. We've nationalized vast aspects of the U.S. economy. Um, the banking, the financial industry, some estimates are maybe 70% of it. The auto industry, what the hell did that have to do with the bailout? Where we rushed out to save jobs in the auto industry, delaying the movement from the low efficiency leviathans of the past to the efficient companies of the future. Politics prefers the past. We should prefer the future, but the future doesn't have the political cloud of the past. And that's a challenge when politics becomes a dominant force. Politics is there. We need government. I'm not an anarchist. But God knows, 50% of the economy, I think too much. Well, we reached the end of our time. I want to thank you all for coming. And in particular, I want to thank our guests, Mr. Fred Smith and Professor Speckler, for a very lively... Thank you.